Can you hear us? Hi. Yes, hi. Hi. So uh, you're with the uh, committee right now. Oh, great. Hi. Uh, Good morning, Annette. This is Representative Tom Stevens. Um, we have um, welcome to the House General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. Um, we have um, most of us are here and we're ready to go to hear your testimony based on um, what you shared with us also electronically. So please feel free to start. Great. Thank you so much for your opportunity to testify today. Um, I am glad that you guys are taking this up. Um, I, so I submitted last night my testimony, which is about 30 pages long, more or less. So it's nice to you, but I'm hoping you guys will find time to, uh, to, uh, to review it in full. Um, here I just want to highlight a few things that I think uh, are important for you uh, to keep in mind as you continue to debate on the balance minimum the wage. And uh, the ones that I will highlight are uh, a few things on uh, a proposal uh, that is related to uh, the to S40, but it's not exactly that bill, which is the youth wage. Um, I also would like to highlight that some uh, points about uh, conversations that I know you guys have, had, have been having about benefits cliff scenarios. And then I'm just going to briefly highlight some of the benefits of uh, uh, going to the dollar minimum wage. So let me begin with the youth wage. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you, I know that you guys are considering, your committee is considering a, uh, a bill uh, that would expand the, uh, the, uh, uh, the high school uh, worker exemption um, from uh, part-time during school year to uh, year-round exemptions from the minimum wage. Um, and I can understand that the re some of the reasons for that. Um, but what I would like to uh, highlight for you, uh, for this committee, is that uh, the, 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 uh, the people that would benefit from their minimum, minimum wage who are teenagers are a very small part of the overall uh, workforce that would be benefiting from a minimum wage policy of, of, of 15. Um, so these, uh, this policy would uh, really have very modest uh, benefits for businesses that are uh, that would be affected by a minimum wage policy and that employ young workers. Uh, but the harm for young workers and for adult workers would be actually uh, is a, a serious harm possibly. Uh, it could, uh, for example, uh, from a lower minimum wage for teen workers, it could incentivize some employers to hire more workers in place of um, more young workers in place of adults, oh, and or to adopt a high turnover staffing model uh, to maintain a youth a young workforce. So the indirect consequences for uh, the, this sort of exemption could be to drive down wages for low wage adults as well. Um, so in essence, this uh, sort of policy could, could create a loophole. Um, another thing that I would briefly like to highlight is that a youth wage, uh, in uh, an expansion of the youth wage in Vermont could possibly have uh, the unintended consequence of advancing uh, corporate attacks on the minimum wage. Uh, the National Employment Law Project uh, tracks all of these issues, and so we are aware of what uh, uh, opponents of the minimum wage have been doing, what they have been proposing. One of the things that we found out late last year was that a, um, a well-known opponent of the minimum wage has been uh, pitching uh, to uh, to uh, the often conservative legislator, legislators. Uh, the uh, implementation of a youth wage in order to drive down wages for all workers on the low wage in the, in the low wage industries. So that is one thing to consider if you are uh, debating uh, such an exception. Um, and one last thing I will uh, say about the youth wage is that uh, young workers uh, do deserve uh, to also earn the full minimum wage in actually exempting them from the full uh, $15 minimum wage could possibly also have the uh, consequences of uh, really impacting uh, college-bound teens, uh, those who are trying to save for college soon uh, by working full-time or close to full-time during the summer, uh, who are, you, often these workers tend to be uh, 
from low income or moderate income families in the way that they uh, uh, try to uh, finance their education is by working uh, the most that they can uh, when school is uh, not in session so that they can pay for some of their tuition or expenses that way. And so these workers, these young workers from low and middle income families could be the most affected. Um, so those are some of the things about the youth which I just really wanted quickly to highlight for you, uh, for your consideration. Uh, but let me go on to the benefits quiz unless you guys have any questions about that specific part of uh, my testimony. No, we're good. Uh, okay, so quickly on the benefits cliff part of my testimony, I know that this is something that you, uh, or something that has raised, I believe, in Vermont as a possibility. And I will speak only uh, in general, in a general sense, because I am not uh, fully, uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't have an expertise specifically in Vermont. But, uh, public uh, programs, but in general, what we have been, uh, what we have found, because this is a question that has come up in other campaigns in other parts of the country as well, what we have found is that the, uh, the major public uh, benefits programs usually have some sort of phase out, a gradual phase out as wages increase, as wages increase, or as income increases for families who are receiving benefits. Uh, the three main and most broadly uh, uh, applicable programs, the EITC, the Child Tax Credit, and SNAP or Food Stamps, uh, those are the, the three main uh, biggest programs in the country that tend to have the most impact because they, uh, they have more generous uh, 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 eligibility criteria. Uh, and uh, these three programs, especially, they have these sort of gradual phase out as uh, income increases. Um, in, in my testimony, in the written part of it, I had uh, I, I put together two scenarios. Um, one is for single adults without children working 40 hours a week. Another one is for single adults uh, raising one child and uh, working 40 hours a week. And another one for uh, one adult with one child uh, working about 20 hours a week. And uh, because a child is adults, uh, in adults who are working full time who don't have dependents tend to not qualify for any program. They really don't have a benefit. They, they wouldn't be seeing that. Um, but for the other two families, uh, the two types of families, single adults with uh, one child working either full or part time, um, the amount that they could possibly be facing varies on the number of hours that they work. Uh, the uh, the uh, single adult with one child working full time will tend to have the most to lose because they, they do, their income may um, go up uh, much more than obviously the uh, the the family working full uh, part time. Um, and if they are receiving uh, the same um, types of benefits, they will have more to do because of that. Nonetheless, in, in either scenario of these two uh, single parents working either part time or full time, the uh, net uh, they are net better off. Nonetheless, one will be uh, will be able to keep more than their income than the other, but they are not going to be in the red. In the end. So that's something to really keep in mind as you also uh, touch on these sort of questions to find a benefit close. Um, and in the end, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, when considering a benefit close uh, scenario, when you, as you uh, continue to debate this uh, topic, uh, if there are in fact benefits close that could uh, be detrimental to some families, um, I, we believe that the that this is an opportunity for the legislature to take up uh, a, a review of uh, the eligibility uh, threshold to the extent that you can. I know that there are some federal rules that may prevent you from fully addressing this, but uh, as as much as you can, as the legislature can, it would be good to have this as an opportunity to review eligibility criteria, to review uh, also. 
funding from the state as, uh, on, to, that was allowing uh, the legislature to address uh, the needs of workers who are earning more because of the minimum wage increase, but who still need some assistance. Um, uh, so those are uh, those are uh, the main points of uh, the benefit clip. Um, and quickly, um, I would like to move on to um, the benefit of a minimum wage. Uh, it, I know that uh, somebody or a David Cooper from EPI will be testifying later, uh, but and he may be able to give you. Uh, much more detailed than I can on, on uh, some of the uh, economic part of uh, the, the benefits of the minimum wage. But um, I wanted to quickly go through some of the, uh, the benefits of the, of the of a fifty dollar minimum wage or a minimum wage increase in general um, that I that I think uh, would be also good to keep in mind. Um, we have found or some. Uh, some studies that have looked at the benefits of uh, increased uh, income have found that they that a minimum wage can be an uh, effective strategy for addressing uh, declining wages, obviously, and opportunities for for low wage workers. Um, there is, for example, San Francisco has had experience with minimum wage increases that uh, take them above significantly above. Uh, both the federal and the California state uh, minimum wage levels. Um, and because of they have had uh, several years of, uh, of sort of experience, there has been an opportunity to do a study of uh, what happens when you uh, raise uh, labor standards, including the minimum wage significantly, what happens to workers in the economy. And what uh, researchers found was that um, the minimum wage policy that uh, San Francisco had adopted in back in 2003 uh, had, uh, um, it, over the long term, had permanently raised uh, citywide pay rates for the bottom 10 percent of the workforce. So this policy of raising the minimum wage uh, did, in fact, have the uh, benefit of, uh, of uh, raising wages for the wage workers. The success of, of the, the uh, the 2003 uh, minimum wage increase in San Francisco um, uh, led the, the mayor in back in 2014 to actually push for and eventually win a uh, $15 minimum wage increase through a ballot proposal, which was uh, overwhelmingly approved by San Francisco uh, uh, voters. So that's that one benefit is the increase permanently, uh, the possibility of increasing permanently the way uh, the wages earned by the bottom 10% of the workforce. Uh, there are some other benefits also of the minimum wage that uh, some uh, researchers have studied, including a decrease in uh, poverty, uh, especially for significant minimum wage increases such as 15, this can be a possibility of also uh, helping address poverty through uh, basic uh, minimum wage uh, labor protection. Um, another a benefit is the uh, possibility of decreasing uh, the rates of child abuse and neglect. Uh, this was an interesting study that we uh, found. And what they found, uh, the, the researchers found, is that uh, minimum wage freeze uh, can directly affect, because they can directly affect their caregivers' uh, ability to provide uh, for the basic needs of their children, uh, they can lead to a decrease. Uh, in, again, the rates of child abuse and neglect. Um, for paid workers, I'm sure that this would be uh, um, a great news um, in, in Vermont for the minimum wage to address any uh, child abuse problems that way. Um, the minimum wage can also lead to improved educational outcomes and graduation rates. Uh, University of Massachusetts study uh, looked at this issue and found that uh, high dropout rates uh, among low-income children can be linked to parents' low-wage jobs, and that youth and low-income families have a greater likelihood of experiencing health problems 
uh, so addressing uh, this through a minimum wage increase uh, would obviously help when, with those two uh, problems that that number of members can be uh, face, maybe facing. Um, and one last thing is just uh, on the overall improvement in health and well-being. Uh, California study uh, that uh, estimated estimated that an increase in the state's minimum wage at, this, at that point of like 213, that was a proposal, um, would, would have significantly benefited the health and well-being of Californians. Um, and they found that um, they, they estimated that uh, these, uh, the workers benefiting would have fewer uh, chronic diseases and disabilities, would experience less hunger, would have uh, less uh, um, incentives for smoking, or and they would take care and could also possibly take care of their of, uh, of obesity rates among that population. Um, and obviously, it would also help with depression and bipolar illnesses. Uh, um, as the minimum wage could uh, help with some of the stress that some. Uh, some parents may be experiencing. Um, those were some of the highlights that I wanted to bring up for for this hearing. Um, again, my testimony is about 30 pages long. Um, I don't know if, if, you get, if I should go on to any other parts of it, uh, but um, maybe I should stop here and um, have you um, ask questions if you have any. For the second half of, of your comments, or were you going to touch on um, some of the effects of the minimum wage on on small businesses? Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. So I um, let me find this area here. So what we um, have found um, is that uh, in general, the minimum wage is not going to this is uh, related to, to, the, to the small business, but in general, the um, the minimum wage does not really uh, have been found to, to be to uh, unemployment rates. Uh, it, it doesn't really have much of an effect on employment in general, neither positive nor negative. Um, and so, when it comes to uh, questions about uh, employment and why they could, whether it could happen, especially with uh, small businesses. It's unlikely uh, because of those uh, uh, yeah, that sort of finding. Um, but uh, with regards to small businesses, um, I don't believe I've done this for Vermont. But uh, when we have looked at other proposals in other states, uh, and we have looked at uh, the uh, the wages that businesses uh, uh, large and small uh, pay, uh, but we find usually is that large businesses do not have a, um, do not pay uh, more than small businesses. Small businesses tend to actually pay a little bit more than uh, large businesses. So increasing the minimum wage to 15 would more or less even the playing field for small businesses. Um, it, it would, uh, uh, again, I haven't looked at this for Vermont, I, I don't think, but we have found that for uh, the other campaigns that we looked at or the other states that we looked at so i can't imagine that vermont would be that different um but uh, so yeah so uh, increasing the minimum wage to 15 uh usually acts as uh, leveling the playing field for small businesses um we find also at uh, the or uh, uh polls of, of uh, business uh ceos and business owners have found that about 80 percent of of uh, the CEOs and uh, business owners um, uh, of, of all sizes, of businesses of all sizes, 80% uh, support raising the, the minimum wage in their states, while only 8% uh, oppose it. So that is a big, uh, a significant uh, level of support for minimum wage increases. Um, we I uh, have in in New York, in the uh, in New York State uh, the the campaign for 15 a couple of years ago. Um, there were uh, representatives for, uh, for small businesses uh, or in businesses in general uh, in general also that endorsed the $15 minimum wage campaign over there. Um, uh, for example, um, the in New York, the Greater New York Chamber of Commerce uh, 
endorsed the campaign, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce endorsed the campaign, uh, the, uh, the Long Island and Westchester Putnam and African American Chambers of Commerce uh, endorsed the campaign, etc. Um, in, in also in, uh, in in California, the Golden Gate Restaurant Association uh, did not oppose the, the proposed increase over there. Um, just in general, this is what happens. A lot of uh, small businesses do uh, provide public support for minimum wage campaigns. Um, it, it, um, there hasn't been a whole lot of studies on uh, the impact of minimum wage increases on small businesses specifically, but uh, from anecdotal evidence, it does tend to seem that businesses of all sizes, uh, even those who are business owners, even those who are skeptic, uh, skeptical of the minimum wage increase, uh, prior to the uh, enactment of the law, um, end up seeing the benefit of, of a higher wage in terms of uh, increased sales for uh, their stores uh, in, in terms of uh, worker retention. Um, and so uh, they tend to spend less because of that on um, recruitment and training to replace workers that may be leaving to seek other better opportunities. So there are benefits for small businesses and large businesses that uh, are from a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Or Yannette, we have a question for you. In general. Was there, Yannette, we have a question for you from Representative Christie. Sure. Hi, Yannette. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your work. Uh, my question speaks uh, directly to uh, states similar to Vermont. Um, as far as the rural nature uh, of our state, uh, have you looked at any comparisons uh, to states similar to us uh, in regard to those uh, uh, general statements? Uh, you said that most of the uh, uh, input you had was anecdotal around the uh, small business reaction, uh, but did you do a comparison state by state or relative to rural states by any chance? Uh, a, we haven't, uh, we've uh, done uh, comparisons or we have done uh, a, a analysis for, for states that uh, have had minimum wage campaigns of 15 or more or so. We did do some for, um, I, I think Maine is more or less uh, uh, similar in terms of population uh, uh, in cities versus uh, rural population. Um, and for them, we did do a uh, small business uh, comparison. And let me just open up that, uh, in that analysis that we did. Um, uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, so as you as you likely know in Maine, uh, there was a ballot proposal for 12, which passed. Uh, so it's not quite 15, but it's uh, very uh, uh, close to, to the 15 dollar minimum wage that you are considering now. Um, and we did do the comparison of small business, large business. Uh, uh, wages, um, and so what we found there, um, we found that uh, in uh, small uh, retailers pay uh, about uh, $12.72 uh, 12 per hour for full-time you know, round work. Um, and in comparison, large uh, retailers paid a significant less, which was about ten dollars and seven cents hourly. Um, so, uh, it, what that uh, report, and I can uh, send uh, forward you this link uh, if, if that would help to read it. What uh, obviously what the, the, this, these numbers suggest is, is that the large or the small retailers were already paying. Um, more or less the minimum wage that was being proposed. 
uh, for the ballot as in May back in 2016. Uh, while uh, the large retailers were paying about uh, almost three dollars less than, um, than they were, um, what uh, we also included in the in that uh, report was um, the benefits uh, for for workers and for the economy in general. As in, in Bain, uh there were about uh, Oh, 29 percent of the state's workforce would have uh, been benefiting from a minimum wage increase. So 29 percent, uh, it would be it would be affecting uh, the employers of those that 29 percent of the state's workforce. So that would have been significant. Uh, we found that uh, cumulatively, the way the uh, uh, the expected wages wage increases for these workers would total about 567 million which uh, when spent uh, by these workers, you can lower which workers tend to spend the money right away, especially in local businesses. Uh, this uh, $567 million would have had an impact uh, on the state economy, and uh, in particular, the, the small businesses that would be uh, seeing that uh, money um, invested back into their own businesses by these workers purchasing their goods and services. Thank you. We have another question from Representative Smith. Uh, good morning. Thank you uh, for being uh, with us on phone today. Uh, I have a question. Are you located somewhere here in Vermont, uh, in Burlington, or in a rural area? No, we have. I would love to move to Vermont. I've been there for. Uh, I was there for a uh, a hearing uh, on the, the initial hearing, the joint committee hearing. Uh, oh. Last year, and I, I, I've been to Vermont, love the place. But to answer your question, no, we don't have a, a, a office in Vermont. We have one in New York, our main one in New York. Uh, I am based in DC. Um, so that's our second main office, and we have another main office in California. And then we have a few uh, home offices in a few parts, uh, other parts of the country. All right, thank and that you. is Vermont, unfortunately. Uh, I'm looking on uh, page 17 of your report here. You say 80% of CEOs and business owners and executives at companies of all sizes support raising the minimum wage. Uh, did you poll businesses in Vermont to come up with the 80%? Or is this no, a, a nationwide poll? That is a nationwide poll. And actually, it was done by a, a typically a opponent of the min minimum wage. And this was actually a poll that was leaked to the media. Um, uh, so that is by, this was by Monk Global uh, on behalf of the Council of State Chambers that did the polling, the poll their, uh, their uh, members and found that 80% of them were in support of raising the minimum wage. Okay. Uh, I'd like to follow up a little bit on something that Representative Christie asked you. Uh, mm -hmm. I see you, you, the business associations, you've mentioned uh, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, the uh, Long Island and Westchester, uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Golden Gate Restaurant Association. Uh, mm -hmm. These are all coming from states. For example, New York's budget is $140 billion. Vermont's budget is probably two or three billion. I'm not really sure what it is. But does that have any, th any bearing on a minimum wage uh, affecting uh, retail, smaller retail businesses? Um, so uh, the part of the reason why I am citing uh, these uh, examples mostly from New York is actually because Anel was very uh, much involved in that campaign, and I personally was very involved in, in uh, supporting and to advocacy in that campaign. So I know a lot about that that campaign in New York, and that those are the businesses that we or the business groups that uh, were that we know were support. Um, because of our work in New York. And I've got um, one. I have one last question for you. Uh, yes. Were you aware that uh, the Vermont Retail Grocers Association is opposed to this minimum wage bill? And have you, if you were or weren't, have you had an opportunity to discuss anything with with, with them and the way they feel about it? No, I have not had the opportunity, and I did not know uh, that they were. Um, it doesn't necessarily surprise me. Um, there are uh, sometimes uh, some 
this is association that will not uh, be endorsing a, um, a, a minimum wage increase, but there are some others that will. And what was surprising about New York, and sorry to go back to that, but uh, what was surprising about the endorsements in New York was were that uh, many of these business associations that I that I uh, um, referenced in my testimony do represent a lot of small businesses. Uh, in fact, uh, many of the businesses their members testified at at the hearings. So uh, it it depends on on who is publicly in. in proposing or endorsing or endorsing campaigns like these. Uh, some will have members that uh, are going to be willing and able to publicly endorse uh, the, the minimum wage increase and others will other ones will may not be as publicly right. uh, taking a position. Alright, thank you. Representative Reed. <clears throat> I that. Um, the end of that bold face where it says 80% of CEOs, business owners, and executives, uh, blah, blah, support re raising the minimum wage, is there a, uh, uh, was that based on a target number or is that just a, uh, you know, 15, 13, 14, or is that just a uh, broad statement? Uh, that, was, uh, that was a general question, but I believe either this one or another poll uh, did uh, include a question about the 15. Surprisingly, there was not a whole lot of uh, uh, antagonism to 15. Okay. Uh, let me just really briefly take a look at that uh, if I can find it out. Uh, okay. Uh, at that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions, mm -hmm. committee? Well, thank you, Yannette. This is a very full report, lots of, lots of um, pick through while we're reading it, and I appreciate you um, taking us through some of the high points on it. I appreciate your time. Sure, no problem. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and uh, I would be happy to, uh, to answer any questions via email or on the phone again with any, any of you guys individually, if that would help. Thank you. Thank you. What's that? You're still the tip department. Oh, wait. Uh-huh. Um, yes. Representative Reed pointed out there's still um, information in your report on the tip wage. Yes. Uh, so I, I understand that you are not considering the tip wage uh, at this point, but I would like to say uh, thank you for bringing that up. I wasn't sure if I should uh, give them that you. Um, are not looking at it now. But um, on the tipped wage, I think it's important to consider maybe in a future legislative session if there is a proposal, it would be good to consider the, the tipped workers. In uh, Vermont, uh, I believe the tipped wage is about 50% of the full minimum wage. And that is uh, greater than in many other states. Uh, it's a great uh, start, place to start, but, I, but we find that because tipped workers tend to have higher poverty rates, it's really important to bring them up all the way to 100% of the full minimum wage. Um, uh, the, we believe that the um, elimination of the tipped wage is really crucial for improving the lives of, of these workers. Um, the, there are various reasons why the, the tipped wage should be eliminated. Uh, I uh, mentioned poverty rates, uh, it's twice the rate of the general uh, workforce for tipped workers, poverty, uh, sorry, twice the rate of poverty uh, from, compared to the, the, the rest of the workforce is actually uh, significant. Uh, in, that's unfortunate that tipped workers, uh, many tipped workers have to experience that type of poverty. But uh, in addition to poverty rates uh, that affect tipped workers, in general, uh, eliminating the tipped wage would really help with the uh, with enforcement uh, of the, the minimum wage for these workers. The uh, the tipped wage or the sub minimum wage system um, is really difficult to enforce because uh, it, uh, because of the way that it, it works. Uh, workers. Uh, Employers uh, and workers would have to be tracking their hour and their tips hourly in order to be fully compliant with the law. 
Um, so because it doesn't happen that way, it depends on the pools that, that uh, many uh, restaurants uh, and other places that uh, 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 policies uh, may have, it's not always clear that uh, the that workers end up keeping because they aren't um, fully. Um, uh, the the test rate is designed so that workers earn at least the minimum wage. That's supposed to be the way that it works, uh, but it doesn't always work that way. And when it doesn't, when workers do not have or not earning a hundred or are not earning at least the minimum wage, it, it, the burden is on them to go uh, to the employer and, uh, and ask to be. Uh, and, uh, to be brought up to the full minimum wage at least. Uh, it's because of the power dynamics, it's not always something that workers uh, are willing to do. Um, and uh, that can be a problem, uh, obviously, for enforcement. Uh, that can lead to wage theft. That may not be, may not be something that work uh, that employers intend to do, but that might be the consequence of that. Um, a, there are other reasons for eliminating the tip wage. The tip wage, or the, the tip workers tend to be uh, uh, predominantly female uh, workers, and that is uh, when you have higher poverty rates, uh, lower uh, in general earnings from tip wage, from tip wage occupations, when you have higher rates of uh, wage theft. Uh, and you have a population that's mostly female, it can be uh, obviously for heads of family of households who are female, that can, especially those who may be single, that can be significantly problematic. And it's just in general, uh, the unfairness of having a workforce that is having to depend on the, uh, the generosity of our customers is problematic in that sense as well. Uh, we find that the Vermont uh, restaurant industry is actually pretty strong. It, it could possibly, uh, very likely, uh, withstand uh, the gradual phase out of the tip switch there, um, and all the way to 15, uh, or whatever the rate may be at that point uh, in the future. Um, in general, when you compare uh, tip credit states such as Vermont, with non-tip credit states, those who pay the full minimum wage to their tip workers, you don't find that uh, the, the tip credit states are doing better, that the Russian industry, those states are doing better than the other ones. In fact, the, the one fair wage states, which is how we call this state, where the tip, uh, where tip workers are on the full minimum wage, um, those states tend to uh, uh, have uh, great uh, Russian industries uh, the industry there uh, in terms of sales and, and employment uh, um, tend to do well. Uh, they uh, also have projections uh, they think from now to show that they are uh, will be still leading uh, in terms of employment in the restaurant sector um, uh, as opposed to uh, for the central uh, states. Um, so in general, I, this is a really uh, important uh, point, uh, a really important policy to consider uh, to eliminate the tip wage. Um, that's more or less uh, a really brief overview of the tip wage uh, issue. And I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. Well said. No, thank you for that clarification. I'm glad to be reminded of, of, of that. That some, while it's not right. necessarily part of the bill right now, it, it has been part of our conversation committee. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for hearing me today. Great. Thank you. Enjoy the day. You too. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Uh, it looks like she she raised some very interesting uh, uh, <clears throat> points, and what I'm wondering is, would it be possible, you know? And I know we we don't have a lot of time, but if we might be able to uh, 
isolate a couple of the data points uh, in her report and maybe have a correlation done, you know, by uh, joint fiscal uh, to see where uh, there's a nexus uh, in some of that to help us uh, zero in. Which points are you thinking? Um, I, I was I was really interested in the uh, that link to Maine uh, being a very similar uh, demographic, you know, to ours. Uh, she didn't have it in this report, but uh, I think that she said that there was a link, you know, that available. It's probably in her bibliography. Uh, that particular link. Okay. In what aspects to, to, to just compare, like? Um, you know, the small business uh, piece um, was, I think, what she was looking at primarily, uh, was how that affects uh, paralleled, you know, our work here. See if we can formulate that into a direct question yeah. a little bit later. Yeah. Okay. Um, Do we have a delay before the next one? Right. How long of a delay would you like? Is he not available? No, we, we told him between 10 and 10 15. Do you want me to tell him to, that we're going for 10? Okay. So break for 10? Yeah. Well, well Good, okay. welcome and thank you for, for weighing in with us. Um, sure. I, I know that you've, you've worked on this issue uh, and did for the um, last fall's study committee um, and appreciate your sharing your views with, um, with us. So um, please, please jump in when you're ready. Okay, we'll do, and, and I understand you all have my presentation or it's, it's uh, being shown to you, so yes. I'm just going to make reference to all of the slides as I, as I go through. Perfect. And there is a little bit of a delay because I have the sound coming through my phone, so if, if I'm talking and you want to interrupt me with a question, please don't hesitate to do so. You may just have to wave to stop me. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, great. Okay. Uh, All right. So again, just by my means of introduction, again, my name is David Cooper. I'm a senior analyst at the Economic Policy Institute, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization in Washington, D.C. Uh, we focus on looking at the economy through the lens of a typical working person. How is it performing for that person? Uh, and we try to research policies that we think will help uh, low and middle income workers and their families. That's our, our mission. Um, so if you turn to the slides, uh, very quickly click into the, the slide two after the title slide, just a quick outline of what I'm going to go over today. Uh, first, try to provide some historical context for the minimum wage, talk a little bit about the different dimensions by which economists typically evaluate the level of the minimum wage, both the standard of living measures and then these relative measures that I'll get into. I'll say a little bit about why I think minimum wage policy is particularly important in Vermont right now. Uh, and then I'll talk about what the research literature says about the effects of raising the minimum wage, because there's been a ton of research on this topic. So we'll get into that as much as we can. So flipping to the next slide, um, you know, I think the, this slide shows what, what I think is uh, the US's primary economic challenge right now, and it has been for decades. The, a chart that my organization has produced. And what you're looking at is the dark blue line in that chart. Uh, I hope you have color. Uh, the dark, dark blue line is uh, total economy productivity. So productivity is just the value of goods and services produced per hour of work in the economy. And this is indexed to 1948. So what's happened to productivity since 1948? And then that light blue line underneath it is Typically, hour, is typical hourly compensation in the economy. So basically, it's the average hourly compensation of a non-supervisory worker since 1948. So excluding managers and highly paid executives, what's happened for those folks? And what you can see is that from 1948 to roughly the mid-1970s, as productivity went up, 
average hourly compensation for most workers went up right in line with productivity, which is what we would expect. As we can produce more for each hour of work, people should be paid more for each hour of work. But at one point in the mid-1970s, we had this disconnect where productivity continued to rise uh, while hourly compensation started to, to go flat. And what you can see is that since 1973, hourly compensation has risen only about 11 percent uh, as of 2015. I looked at the data for 2016, it's about 12 percent now as of 2016 since the mid-1970s, while productivity has risen, uh, you know, it's it, it almost doubled since that time. And I should note that this compensation measure includes contributions to uh, fringe benefits, so things like employer contributions to health care and retirement plans. So it's not that contributions to those things have uh, taken money away that would have been going into wages. So when we look at total compensation, it's been basically flat since the 1970s on an hourly basis. And this, but one thing to, the one thing that's important to note is that this story has not been uniform for all workers. If you flip to the next slide, the next slide is showing what's happened to hourly wages at different points in the wage distribution. And that top line is wages for highly paid workers. So wages at the 95th percentile have risen about 50% since 1979, which is the first year that we have good hourly wage data from. Wages of typical workers in the US, or middle wage workers, workers at the median, have only risen about 9%, a little over 9% since 1979. And this is all adjusted for inflation. Low wage workers, represented in this chart by the, the gray line, and that's the 10th percentile wage, so someone who's, who's making uh, more than 10% of workers but less than 90% of workers, their wages have just barely risen uh, above where they were in 1979, and that only happened in the last year. Prior to that, those low-wage workers were actually earning less than their counterparts almost 40 years ago after inflation. Um, so this rising inequality in, in wages has led to a host of problems for the U.S. Uh, we have, it has stymied our ability to, to reduce poverty more greatly. It has led to a, uh, a huge loss of income for, for middle-income households. We have a, a chart that I didn't include just for the sake of time, basically showing that had household income risen uniformly across the income distribution since the late 1970s, the typical U.S. household would be making about $18,000 more per year uh, today than they do. Uh, but the huge growth in inequality has led to you know, that, loss of, that, that loss in income that, that they're not making. Now, I'm going pretty quickly. Again, if anyone wants to stop me, please don't hesitate. If you go to the next one. Yes. Question, Representative Stevens. No. Uh, thank you for bringing the productivity into the conversation here. I, I have a question, though, about about the timing of everything. I mean, the, the way that we've treated workers at, at wage levels has changed essentially since the mid 70s or early 80s, where unions have decreased that, you know, yes. and that's suppressed wages across the board. Um, right. But how do we, and, and, and on top of it, we have shipped many, many, many manufacturing jobs overseas. Yeah. Which, which to me seems that that in and in of itself, moving from a manufacturing economy to a service economy, has suppressed the wages as well. How does that compare with, with this increased productivity? What is the productivity measuring? How do you measure how, how good of a cashier I am at a, at a gas station? Um, sure. So you're actually, you're, you're jumping to my next slide for me. So thank you. Okay. Uh, if you flip to the next slide, uh, you know, when we talk about what's led to this breakdown between productivity and wages, a lot of the causes are exactly what you're talking about. Um, the first one being globalization. The shift, uh, as, you, as you said, to a lot of manufacturing jobs being moved off sea, uh, uh, offshore, uh, overseas, um, with, with no protections or very little protections for domestic workers, the decline of unionization and collective bargaining, reducing folks' bargaining power, uh, too many periods of high unemployment, which have reduced worker bargaining power because employers don't have to raise wages to attract and retain staff when there's high unemployment, um, the growth in the financial sector as a share of the economy, and the explosion in executive compensation, mostly since the late 1990s, 
And then the last bullet is the thing that we're going to talk about today, is the labor policy decisions uh, that have reduced worker bargaining power, one of them being failure to adequately raise the minimum wage. Now, uh, the gentleman, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, mentioned uh, you know, how that affects productivity. Well, the productivity measure that I'm showing is, was total economy productivity. So it's, it's what's the, the whole economy's capacity, what is the whole economy producing uh, per hour of work? That has steadily risen. That doesn't necessarily mean that productivity in every single occupation has risen the same way. Some of them have, have risen a lot more, some of them a lot less. The point is simply that the U.S. economy has, has had the growth in its capacity to reward everyone more for each hour of work, uh, which has happened for the reasons that are listed on this, this page, these five reasons that have contributed to that. Thank you. Does that, yep. does that get to your question, sir? Yeah, I didn't anticipate the third slide, so thank you. Sure, yeah, no problem. So. Um, so again, we're going to be talking about this last bullet, the labor policy action, specifically the minimum wage. And if you flip to the, the slide after that, uh, this is slide six, what you can see on this chart, that blue line again is that labor productivity line. The red line is the inflation adjusted value of the federal minimum wage. And what you can see is that from the minimum wage's inception in the late 1930s until you know, roughly the late 60s, uh, when it reached its high point, the minimum wage was raised at roughly the same pace as productivity growth. Uh, in 1968, the federal minimum wage reached its inflation-adjusted high point of about $10 an hour in today's dollars. Uh, throughout the 1970s, the federal minimum wage was raised again relatively frequently, but we had very high inflation in the 70s, so the value of the minimum wage sort of stayed flat. In the 1980s, we didn't raise the federal minimum wage at all. So its, in value, its value just eroded throughout that decade. And then in the, we only raised it two more, two more sets of times in the mid-1990s and then again in the late 2000s. But those increases during those periods were never large enough to undo the erosion in value that took place in the 1980s, such that today at 725, the federal minimum wage is worth about 25% less than it was worth uh, in the late 1960s. I'm going to get to Vermont specific stuff in a minute. So again, this is just sort of the federal context. The light blue line in the middle of that chart is showing what would the federal minimum wage be if it were linked to just the wages of typical workers in the economy. So again, I was saying earlier that wages for the typical worker haven't really grown that much since the late 70s. But if we had just linked the federal minimum wage to those wages, it would be almost $12 an hour today. If the federal minimum wage since 1968 had grown at the same pace as overall productivity growth, it would be almost it would be over $19 an hour today. So again, that doesn't mean that necessarily we should have a federal minimum wage of over $19 an hour, or that you know low wage workers have seen that same level of productivity growth. But what it's saying is that there is capacity in the the economy for minimum wages significantly higher than what we currently have based on either growth in average wages for normal workers or overall productivity growth. <laughs> so flipping to the next chart, and this is where I'm, I, I want to start getting into some of the Vermont specific data. This chart is showing what's happened to hourly wages in Vermont since 1979. And the picture is a little bit better than the US average, um, but still you know, nothing to, to pop the champagne over. Um, what you can see is that at the 90th percentile, again, high wage workers in Vermont have done relatively well since the late 70s. Wages at the 90th percentile have grown about 41% since 1979. Middle wage workers, represented as the, the median wage, the gray line, have risen about 27% since 1979. Again, not, not, not bad relative to what's happened for the U.S. as a whole. And then at the 10th percentile, wages have risen about 11% since 1979. Again, much better than the U.S. average, but nothing, you know, for, for 40 years of economic growth, an 11% raise is really nothing to celebrate. You also notice that most, most, if not all, of that increase took place in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Now, why is that? That's because at that time, the federal minimum wage was raised, Vermont's minimum wage was raised, 
And we had very low unemployment. We had unemployment below 4% for a number of years there. When you have that much low unemployment, you're getting a lot of market pressure to raise wages as well. So that's why you saw that huge, that big jump at the late 1990s. The other thing that I would point out is that wages at the 10th percentile of Vermont in more recent years have started to go up as a result of the increases the state has enacted in recent years, plus the fact that Vermont's minimum wage is indexed for inflation each year because it goes up a little bit to reflect uh, however much prices have gone up. And that's what I wanted to point out in the next slide, if you'll flip to slide eight. There's a lot of lines here, you know, it's, it's very busy, but uh, so I'll just point out, highlight a couple points of it. And I made this chart uh, a couple of years ago when I was giving a presentation in New Hampshire, so it doesn't go to the most recent year, but the trends are still the same. And I just want to point out, this is showing what's happened uh, to wages in Vermont relative to what's happened to wages in uh, the, the, the state, neighboring states in New England. And I would just focus on the light blue and the orange lines in each chart. And if you look at Maine, you can see that from about 2000 until 2009, roughly when a recession started, low wages for the bottom 20% were basically flat, and then they started to fall after the recession. In Massachusetts, in the bottom left, it was a little more kind of up and down throughout the 2000s, some growth at the late 2000s, and then sort of down again after the recession. In New Hampshire, New Hampshire is actually, I think, the most interesting one. You had this growth in wages until the early 2000s, and then they just slowly eroded over the next uh, decade, basically. In Vermont, at the 10th and 20th percentile, so basically the bottom 20% of workers, wages rose until you know the, the 2001, roughly 2002, and then they stayed basically flat. That's a direct result of the indexation in Vermont's minimum wage, the fact that the minimum wage is adjusted for inflation every year. And basically, what I want to point out there is that you know, none of your neighbors, at least when I made this chart, had that indexation. And that's why it's so important, because Vermont, better than any of its neighbors, have, have actually preserved wages for the bottom 20% of workers, uh, whereas a lot of your neighbors haven't been able to do that because they don't have that inflation, uh, inflation adjustment. Okay. So flipping to the next chart, the next slide, now uh, I'm going to start to get into kind of how I think you should be evaluating levels of the minimum wage. And this chart is showing data from a tool that my organization produces called the Family Budget Calculator. The Family Budget Calculator uh, has highly localized data on the cost of living for a variety of different essential uh, you know, budget items, housing, food, child care, transportation, health care, other necessities and things like clothing, cell phone, uh, and taxes. And we have data on this for every single county in the United States, as well as every single major metropolitan area. And you can choose what size family you have, and it'll tell you what it takes in that area to have what we call a modest but adequate standard of living. So this is not destitution, this is not absolute poverty, this is someone who has a, a secure standard of living, they're paying all their bills, but they have no savings afterwards. There's nothing built into this budget for savings, for college, retirement, you name it. Um, and these data are actually probably a little outdated. This is from our 2014 version of the calculator. We just released a new one about a month ago. Um, but any, anyway, even looking at the 2014 data, what I did is I pulled up the data for rural Vermont. So this is not Montpelier or, um, or Burlington. This is sort of the more rural areas. And what you're seeing is that in that first column, that left-hand most column, uh, someone who's a single adult with no children needs a little over $32,000 a year to have what we would call a modest but adequate standard of living. If that person works full-time, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, that's an annual, that's an hourly wage of about a little over fifteen dollars an hour, fifteen sixty-six per hour as of twenty fourteen. Question for yeah, I, have, yeah. I have a question for you, David. Uh, sure. Brian Smith from Derby. I live in the ruralest part of the state. Uh, <clears throat> most of the people that I know that are making ten fifty an hour, single or married or one with a child or one with not, don't work forty hours a week in the Northeast Kingdom. They work fifty and sixty. Yeah. Partially because they choose to and they like their jobs and partially because they have no options. 
Right. Uh, do you take you? It doesn't look like you've taken into any consideration here when you're basing something on a on a forty hour week. Well, that's right. I'm only uh, I'm just doing the calculation for someone who's working forty hours. If they choose to work more than that, you know, so be it. But. Uh, I think you know we have a lot of labor standards that uh, target folks being able to work 40 hours, and that's all they should have to work. You know, if, if someone wants to work more, so be it. But um, you know, I, I think it's it would be your decision whether you would think you need to set labor standards such that uh, it would require someone to work more than 40 hours to achieve their. Sure, their, um, I, I agree with that. But you'll also see. Uh you know, these people living in poverty, they've got two skidoos in their yard, uh, or a four-wheeler, or a four-wheel drive truck that they're making payments on, and these, these figures just kind of don't add up, so they must be making time and a half, so probably most of the people are working 50 hours a week, I would guess. I, I have no idea. I, I, okay. you know, all, all I'm presenting is, is what it would take right. for a regular full-time worker. Okay, I, I appreciate that, thank you. Representative Gonzalez. Uh, so in addition to no savings, does your budget also assume no debt? So this is just paying the bills that are listed here. So if someone had debt, credit card debt, student loans, whatever, that would have to be on top of all this. Thank you. So again, just um, other questions? I also assume that it means no savings. Yes, that's right. Or retirement. or Correct. Yeah. Um, and there are other measures like this. There's an MIT has a similar sort of living wage calculator and, and other folks produce things like this. I think there's even some Vermont specific ones elsewhere. But in any, in any event, the, the, not, the findings are all pretty much the same, that to meet this adequate but standard of living on a full-time schedule, you need more than 15 even right now, or even as of 2014. Um, okay, so flipping to the next chart, this is just showing uh, the value of the federal minimum wage again, and then also Vermont's minimum wage. The, the gray lines are the nominal values, so the discrete dollar values. The green line is the inflation-adjusted value of Vermont's minimum wage. The black line is the, the inflation-adjusted value of the federal minimum wage. Again, you've got that high point in 68. And then you've got today's value. 2018, the Vermont minimum wage is equal to 1050 right now, I believe. In 2017 dollars, so in last year's dollars, that's the equivalent of 1027. Uh, that's why you're seeing the 1027 there for 2018. And because it's as in the current law scheduled to be indexed for inflation, we've got that flat line going out, going forward after 2018. Flipping to the next chart, the next slide, slide 11, you can see uh, where the minimum wage would be at 15 in 2024, which I understand is what the, the Senate bill that was passed would be. 15 in 2024 is the equivalent of about 1274 uh, in today's dollars because inflation obviously is going to be eating away at the value as of those increases until you get to 15. So it's a real increase after inflation of about 24% over today's uh, minimum wage value over the next six years. Flipping to the next chart, slide 12, uh, this is just showing how that minimum wage full-time annual income compares to the federal poverty line. Now again, anyone who is a poverty researcher or who, who has done anything with the federal poverty line knows that it is a woefully inadequate measure of what it actually costs for folks to get by. Nevertheless, it is our longest running measure of, of, uh, of income adequacy, so people still use it. What you can see is that today's Vermont minimum wage, uh, a full-time, full-year worker at the minimum wage makes just over the poverty line for a family of three. If you were to raise the minimum wage to $15 by 2024, you'd get just about $2,000 above uh, the four-person federal poverty line. <laughs> Now the next chart, if you flip to slide 13, this is one of the other measures that I think is really important to consider and one of the things that, one of the dimensions that economists often use to evaluate the strength of the minimum wage, and that is to look at what's the minimum wage relative to the wages of typical workers in the economy. So in other words, how far away is the lowest paid job from a middle class job? 
Uh, and what this chart is showing is that at its highest point in 1968, the federal minimum wage was equal to a little more than half the wages of a typical worker in the economy. So the, the two lines are just two different ways of measuring uh, wages of typical workers. One of them is the average wage of production workers. The other one is the median wage of full-time workers. But they basically tell the same story. In 68, the minimum wage was equal to 52 to 53 percent, percent of the typical wages in the economy. As of 2017, the federal minimum wage was equal to about a third of the wages of a typical worker in the economy. So someone who is in that lowest paid job, whether they are starting out in the workforce or whether they have been stuck in a low wage job for a while, they are much further away from the middle class than someone in that same position a generation ago. Now that the next slide shows the Vermont specific data. I don't, there is no, I can't get Vermont data back to 68. Uh, so we can look at it from 67 forward. And what you can see is that in 1979, at its highest point, uh, the, the minimum wage in Vermont was equal to almost 54% of the median wage in Vermont. So again, a, the lowest paid worker in the state's economy was making a little more than half uh, what a middle wage worker was, was making. As of 2017, that value was about 46%, 46.4%. Uh, the dotted green line is a projection of, of what would happen under current law if there's no changes made. If you assume that middle wage workers, their wages will rise just a little bit faster than inflation. This is assuming a, a half a percentage point above inflation, real wage growth for middle wage workers. Then the minimum wage would equal about 45.6% by 2024. Uh, of the median wage in Vermont. If you went to 15 by 2024, based on these projections, the minimum wage would equal about 56.6% of the median wage in Vermont. So middle wage workers would be earning a little bit more uh, than their counterparts in 79. And I see a gentleman uh, raising hand. Yes, Representative Reed. Thanks. I've been called worse than that. <laughs> um, th does that, uh, th does the statistic for the middle wage jobs, does that take into effect the upward uh, upward wage compression? Yeah, so uh, raising the minimum wage is, is never really going to affect wages at the median. You probably, most of the, most of the research shows that the wage compression, uh, at least in the five years after an increase, tends to occur uh, up to maybe 20, 25th percentile. It's never really going to rise as high as the 50th percentile. Never as high as the median. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to re respectfully disagree with you on that, but that's cool. Thank you. I, I, I'm just, you know, that's what the research has found in, in, from previous minimum wage increases. You know, I, I, I couldn't say for, for something that uh, would be significantly, you know, larger than past increases. Thank you. Okay, so um, the next slide um, is where I'm starting to get into why I think uh, minimum wage policy is particularly important in Vermont. So there's a, there's a lot of misconceptions about who's affected when you raise the minimum wage. Uh, there's sort of a, a long uh, stereotype that minimum wage workers are just teens. Uh, working part-time after school for, you know, video game money or whatever it may be. Um, the reality is that most low-wage workers who would be affected by increases in the minimum wage uh, are, are older breadwinners for their families. So the average age of someone who would be affected by an increase to $15 by 2024 is 38 years old. Uh, and these are Vermont-specific statistics. Um, the vast majority are not teenagers. 88% are 20 or older. 45% are 40 or older, a little more than half are women. 22% uh, of these workers have children. The majority work full time. And on average, they earn more than half their family's total income. Now, these are statistics from uh, a, a, an analysis that, that I did uh, years ago when I was looking at an increase in the federal minimum wage up to 15 by 2024. But these are the Vermont specific numbers. The next few charts are from an analysis done by uh, a researcher at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston on Molchata. Uh, the researcher also did a similar analysis. Our statistics are a little bit different from each other, but the conclusions are, are basically the same. Um, Chata finds that uh, if you increase the, the minimum wage in New England, in any of the New England states to 15 by 2024, who would be making 
uh, who would be affected by this increase. And in Vermont, what's interesting is that the share of those workers that have a college degree is higher in Vermont than in any other state in New England, 24% in Vermont compared to the next closest one being 23% in Massachusetts. Um, flipping to the next slide, looking at how many of these workers work full time in Vermont, uh, Charter finds that 72% of workers who would get a raise from 15 by 2024 in Vermont work full time. Again, that's the highest percentage of in any state in New England. Looking at the slide after that, this is showing the, the average share of family income earned by uh, workers likely to be impacted by 15 in 2024. Chata finds that on average, these workers make 63% of their family's total income in Vermont. Again, not the highest percentage of any state uh, in New England. Yes, I see the hand. So can you go back one slide and just, sure. and just give, give us a uh, different context for what this means to you? Yeah. In terms of the full-time so, workers in particular? In, in terms of what? In terms of the full-time workers in particular? Yeah, I, you know, I think what this is just showing is that, uh, you know, in, in some cases, it may be that an increase in the minimum wage is going to primarily benefit, uh, you know, workers who are only working part-time. This may be, it may be a second earner in the family. There may be, uh, you know, one, one spouse, for example, that works full-time and then a spouse that only works part-time, and it may be that, you know, typically part-time workers earn lower wages, so a minimum wage increase might only be affecting those part-time workers. What this is showing is that almost three-quarters of the workers that would be impacted by an increase in Vermont's minimum wage, $15, are full-time workers. So, you know, these are primary breadwinners. These are folks who, this is their primary job. Uh, it's not something that they're doing just sort of on the side. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so we, we went over the next slide, so I'm gonna skip that one, we'll go to the next one, the slide with the, the map of the US on it. So now, let's talk a little bit about research on the minimum wage and employment. Um, you know, this is the topic that you hear most discussed when the, a minimum wage proposal is, is put forward, is what's the effect on employment going to be? Now, early research on the minimum wage's effect on employment in the 1970s and 80s seemed to, seemed to confirm the sort of textbook understanding the textbook understanding being that if you raise the minimum wage, it's going to lead to a loss in jobs. Uh, again, re early research focused on increases in the federal minimum wage. They seem to confirm that finding. In the 1990s, after you had that whole decade in the 80s where there was no increase in the federal minimum wage, you had a lot of states start raising their minimum wages above the federal minimum wage, including Vermont. Uh, and when that happened, it created what we would call natural experiments. You could look at what happened uh, to jobs in one state that raised its minimum wage compared to a state that didn't. And probably the most famous of these studies in the mid-1990s, a study by uh, economist uh, David Card and Alan Kruger, looked at what happened in fast food employment along the New Jersey-Pennsylvania border when New Jersey raised its minimum wage and Pennsylvania did not. And what they found is that fast food employment on the New Jersey side of the border actually went up relative to uh, fast food employment on the Pennsylvania side of the border after New Jersey raised its minimum wage. So this went exactly opposite uh, to what the conventional thinking had been. And this really sent the economics profession into a bit of a tailspin. And, and there were uh, tons and tons of papers published in subsequent decades trying to, to isolate whether this is just uh, a single isolated case where this was happening or whether this was, uh, whether there was a need for us to really rethink our understanding of the minimum wage's effect on employment. If you flip to the next slide, you know, as I said, there were tons and tons of papers published after Cardin Kruger's work trying to figure out what was going on here. One of the most important ones was a study in 2010 that took that Cardin Kruger approach and applied it nationwide. So they took the case study and they generalized it. They looked at what happened at cross cross uh, border counties for every single minimum wage increase in the United States from 1990 through, I think, 2006. Uh, and this started just showing all those border counties that were analyzed. And what the researchers found is that the increases in the minimum wage had no detectable effect on employment uh, in the 
states that raised them relative to the states that didn't when they look at this cross-border comparison. If you flip to the next slide, this is again just showing how much research has been done on this topic. There have been a lot of meta-studies, so studies of studies, taking the findings uh, of, of all the different research on the minimum wage. The chart that I'm showing is the one that looks, we call it a funnel graph. It's, you have know, this spike uh, shooting up. All those blue dots on that graph are estimates of the minimum wage's effect on employment in some study. And along the x-axis, along the horizontal axis, it's the effect on jobs. So as you get closer to zero, that would mean no effect. As you get further to the left, that would mean a negative effect. If you go further to the right, that would be a positive effect on jobs. The vertical axis, the y-axis, is the statistical power of the study. So in other words, how good of an estimate is it? What's the precision of the estimates from a statistical standpoint? And what you can see is that the estimates are clustering right around zero. And the estimates with the highest statistical power, the ones that are most precise, are falling right on that zero line. So again, this is confirming this research that increases in the minimum wage, at least the ones that were done throughout the 1990s and 2000s, have really no significant effect on employment whatsoever, either positive or negative. Or at least that effect was so small that we've had trouble measuring it. Now there have been, I, I see a hand. Um, and when you're saying no effect on employment, uh, since these are meta studies, I assume that that means a wide variety of things. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by no effect? Yeah, so let, let me let's hold that question because I get into that in, in a subsequent slide. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so just last, last slide on this topic. Uh, if you turn to the next one, this is a, a, a new study that just came out last year that is really novel because it looked at this in a totally different way. What the researchers did was they took every job by hourly wage and put it into bins uh, of different wages relative to the minimum wage. And they, and they looked at what happened to the number of jobs in these different wage bins five years after a minimum wage increase. And what they found is that the wages five years, the, the jobs five years later uh, above the new minimum wage, so that was the blue lines, was essentially exactly the same as the number of jobs below the old minimum wage, uh, which would be the orange line. So in other words, and this is a quote from the study, on average, the number of missing jobs paying below the new minimum during the five years following implementation closely matches the excess number of jobs paying just above the new minimum this leaves the overall number of low-wage jobs essentially unchanged while raising average earnings of workers below the threshold. So again, just further confirmation that the changes that happen to, to the job structure after a minimum wage increase, you tend to see more jobs paying more than the new minimum and obviously less paying, uh, less jobs that are paying lower than the new minimum. So, um, you know, why is this? Why isn't there some substantial negative effect on jobs? If you flip to the next slide, there's a great paper by John Schmidt called Why Does the Minimum Wage Have No Discernible Effect on Employment? that talks about the different channels of adjustment through which we think these effects are, 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 being, are playing out in the economy. Why isn't there a, a more substantial negative effect on jobs? The first one is that when you raise the minimum wage, it tends to lead to a reduction in turnover. Workers stay on the job longer, uh, and as a consequence of that, that's a cost savings for business because they don't, have to they don't have to spend as much recruiting, hiring, and training new workers. Um, and the research on this has shown, has tended to find that for every 10% increase in the minimum wage, you get about a 2.2% reduction in turnover. The second thing is that when you have more works, me, more workers staying on the job longer. They tend to find improvements, there tends to be improvements in their productivity. Businesses find new efficiencies for those workers, maybe because managers decide if they're paying workers more, they should expect them to be more efficient, more productive. In any event, that's a cost savings as well for businesses. You do get wage compression, which the, the one gentleman uh, referred to earlier. In other words, workers who may have been higher up the food chain may see 
a smaller raise than they would have otherwise because some of that money is being uh, paid to workers at the bottom of the wage scale, and so the overall wage distribution is compressed. Um, you do see small price increases resulting from minimum wage increases, uh, but the size of these price increases, it's important to, to note, is, is relatively small. Um, the studies that have looked at this have found generally that a 10% increase in the minimum wage leads to a price increase in highly affected industries of between 0.3% and 1.5%. So that's not overall prices, that's just the industries that, that hire a lot of low-wage workers, places like fast food, retail, hotels, that sort of thing. The, was the lady want me to raise her hand? I I saw no, I, I did. Thank I don't you. know if you can see him in the corner. Uh, <laughs> I can, I'm sorry. I, I see where you're, you're talking here about there would be some small increases. Uh, I'm, I'm on, I think, yeah, we're on the same chart. Uh, in Vermont, there are a lot of older people living today than there used to be. Probably, maybe because young people are leaving for better wages, better jobs somewhere else, regardless. But uh, these people that are old and live, they don't get any more money now. They're living on a fixed income. Uh, with all of the services in the area, uh, if wages are increased and the minimum wage is increased, don't you feel it's going to have an impact on these people living on fixed incomes when they go to their shopping or they go to a dinner or something like that? Well, to, to the extent that they, they spend their money in, in highly affected industries like fast food, uh, restaurants, and, and some retail places, it's possible, sure, that, that uh, they could pay more in, in prices, for sure. But again, you know, the, the price increases are, are overall are quite modest. I mean, a 0.3% increase in, in the cost of something relative to a 10% increase in the pay for a lot of workers um, you know, that's a trade-off that I think some people would, would say is reasonable for, for folks on fixed income. Sure, it, it may be harder. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. Okay, thank you. So, so lastly, the fifth item on this uh, list is, uh, is also worth pointing out, and that is the increased consumer demand generated by an increase uh, for the minimum wage. And, and what that is basically saying is that when you raise the minimum wage, you're effectively shifting income from an entity that is less likely to spend every single dollar, namely business owners, uh, shareholders, higher income households, uh, to a low wage worker who probably spends every single dollar they receive right away, simply because they have to. So because of that shift, you tend to see an increase in consumer spending overall. It provides this modest stimulus. Uh, and, uh, and so a lot of businesses are able to absorb those additional costs simply because they have more customers coming through the door as a result of uh, the minimum wage increase. Now, flipping to the next slide, um, the lady asked about how to correctly sort of understand these, these job loss effects, if they exist. Um, and, you know, the point I would make on this first, that first bullet point is, is just to say that research has always been very clear on wage impacts. And what I mean by that is that every study that has looked at the incre an increase of the minimum wage on wages finds that raising the minimum wage does raise wages, period. But the important impacts are a lot more opaque. Uh, as I said, the results, there's this huge sort of academic debate as to whether there is a small negative or a small positive effect. But the, the truth is that the effect is so small that I, I don't think folks should be, you know, I don't think policymakers uh, should be making their decisions based upon whether this effect is statistically significant or not, or statistically significant or not, just given how small it is. When we talk about job loss in the low-wage labor market, what we're really talking about is a change in the total hours of work for low-wage workers. Now, most low-wage workers only work a portion of the year, uh, and they tend to change jobs a lot more frequently than higher-wage workers. So if that's the case, if you raise the minimum wage, and it actually did have some negative effect on the labor market, what that would mean for folks on the ground is that those were those low-wage workers who would have spent a portion of the year unemployed or were not or just choosing to not work, they might spend a little bit longer unemployed, or they might spend a little bit longer just choosing to not work as a result of the higher minimum wage. Or their employer might reduce the number of hours that they work per week. But because they're earning more per hour, on net their annual income is likely to still be higher than it would have been otherwise or at least no lower than it would have been otherwise. 
And research has generally confirmed this. If we look at what's happened to total family income after minimum wage increases, it tends to go up. So in other words, whatever the effects on total hours worked are, uh, there is a clear positive effect on total earnings for the year. Uh, and this is true even of pessimistic analyses of minimum wage increases. They tend to find that, uh, you know, that the, the increase in the minimum wage still leads to a net increase in income even if hours are reduced. So just to conclude, uh, and obviously I'm, hoping, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to take more questions, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that today's low-wage workers are making less on average than their counterparts uh, 50 years ago, at least nationally and, and in Vermont. It's, it's a little bit better, but, but still 11% increase is not, uh, as I said, something to pop the champagne corks over. Past increases in the minimum wage have been too infrequent, uh, leaving millions without sufficient earnings to, to meet their basic needs. And this has led to a growth in inequality between workers at the bottom and workers in the middle that is shown by those charts that I showed earlier. Uh, minimum wage workers in Vermont are more likely than a lot of their New England counterparts to be primary breadwinners working full time. Uh, and research has shown that increases in minimum wages have not led to any substantial negative effect on jobs. This justifies bolder increases. This, this justifies trying larger increases that we've done in the past, because if the increases we've done in the past have had no substantial negative effect, then we basically left money on the table for low-wage workers. Uh, and unless we do those bolder increases, we're never going to get the minimum wage to a level that is actually a, a, a level that allows someone to live a decent life. So I'll stop there. Representative Stevens. Regarding this last slide, but also the concept of um, what full-time work is. I mean, Vermont, as a rule, when it talks about about this kind of, in, in this argument, a full-time employee is someone who works 40 hours a week. Um, of course, under uh, 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 AC, the ACA, that's like 28 hours a week is considered a full-time. I mean, there's lots of different levels. But when it comes to the difference between job loss and full-time jobs, I mean, we're talking more about a, a minimum wage worker working 40 hours a week. That could be two jobs. That's not, I mean, there's just not as many low-wage jobs that go to 40 hours a week. Do you, or I'm making that as a statement. It should be a question. Do you find that most low-wage jobs are, are coming in less than 40 hours? Uh, we do know that most low-wage workers, do, uh, they, do, they tend to work not full hours per week and not full weeks per year. So yes, most low-wage workers are more likely to not work full time full year. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, so when I say when I say that you know fifteen dollars an hour is if at forty hours a week, fifty two weeks a year is equivalent to thirty one thousand two hundred dollars, that's really the outside for those numbers. I mean, but a person can work forty hours; they just may be in different jobs and therefore different benefits and different you yeah. know, different schedules of. Of, of benefits that they might receive. Is that, I mean, I, I'm not wrong in doing it that way, am I? No, that's, that, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, someone, folks will, will find hours however they can, and that's actually one of the, the channels of adjustment that is understood to be why we don't see, the, the way that some of these effects may be playing out is that a worker, when they get that wage increase, may actually stop working in their second job and just start, just retain one job at that point because uh, at a higher hourly rate, they're able to, to meet their needs on only one job. And second, second um, question on these lines, and it just about went out of my head as, as, as I was um, going to ask you. So let me get back to you in a sec, if, sure. if we're still here. <laughs> Representative Strong. So thank you for your presentation. Um, Dave, my question is, um, in the lower wage jobs, minimum wage jobs, how did you take into account the fact that those who do show up and, and receive training and are dependable often get raises um, in that job within day, uh, weeks, months, uh, or a year? How do you take into account um, that level? Uh, in a way, the study reminds me, it, just, it stays at minimum wage and that's just it, but over time their wages do go up. So how do you take that into account? Well, so you have to remember that what I'm looking at in all of these, uh, in all the historical charts, it's looking at 
kind of who is at that 10th percentile wage. It doesn't mean that it's the same person year after year who's earning the 10th percentile wage. They may be slowly moving up, but it's a representation of uh, whoever the worker is in that 10th percentile, they are worse off or no better off than a person in that same position uh, 50 years ago or 40 years ago, whatever it may be. And it's true that, that folks do see raises as they stay in a, in a job and, and they may be moving away from the minimum wage, but that doesn't mean that someone 10 years later should be making the same as someone in that starting role you know, 10 years prior. You know, be, with, because you have productivity improvements, because the economy is growing, we have the capacity for that person to start off at a better position uh, than the person that preceded them a decade ago. And that's what I think minimum wage policy is, is about in many ways. It's, it's raising that floor so that each generation starts off a little better than the next one or each, you know. Uh, yeah, I think, I think I said it reasonably well there. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> Uh, Representative Stevens. And, and so that was, that was, I'm sorry, that was kind of where I, I slipped. So thank you, Representative Strong, for, for, for picking me up here. Sure. The, the thing is, <laughs> anecdotally in particular, but also the, the idea that the minimum wage is an entry level wage and that people do receive raises off of that because that's what we think should happen. Yeah. We've also heard testimony where there are people who especially work in larger stores. Um, fast food chains where they have not received sure. an increase and that it's company policy not to give them incremental raises uh, right. except for when when forced when mandated by law um, do, do any of your studies you know I mean, kind of going along with what Rep representative strong was asking do your studies show that there are people that do l linger in low-wage jobs because those are the jobs they can get, whether it's a small town or whether it's in a, in a fast food store. Well, so that's actually what um, the, the, the chart that is, uh, you know, the, the cartoon of the, the stereotype and then the real uh, person, you know, who's affected by minimum wage policy, that's actually what that chart is getting at. Because when you look at statistics of workers that are at exactly the minimum wage, they tend to do fit closer to that stereotype. They tend to be a lot younger. They tend to be uh, part-time workers. They tend to be uh, you know, folks who, who, who don't necessarily have family. When you start moving just a little bit above that minimum wage, the demographic profile starts to totally change into the, the average person being this older worker who's working full-time, who may have children. Uh, and that is a consequence of what you're describing, that even if some folks maybe got one raise at some point to get them above the minimum wage, there's still a lot of people who are earning just above the minimum wage that are older in life, further along in their, in their work life, uh, and, and are not just starting out in the labor market. And, and following up with that in terms of the, your, your earlier posts, uh, slides on the sub-minimum wage, the number of people who are in sub-minimum wage, and the high number of Vermonters who have college degrees in, in these, you know, I mean, again, the, the, this, the thing that we say is that we'll go to college, you'll get a better paying job. Yeah. That doesn't seem to always, I mean, I mean, that is true to a degree, but what we're seeing in Vermont is people, can I, can I extrapolate and say what we're seeing is that people who have education aren't being paid at a level that their education perhaps should get them to? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, when the, the fact that so many workers who have college degrees would be affected by minimum wage policy shows that, uh, unfortunately, college is not a cure-all for, for, for a lot of these folks. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't solve the, the underlying stagnation of wages uh, that I, I talked about at the outset. And actually, if we look at what's happened to wages for college-educated workers, they've basically been flat for the last 20 years. So even though college educated workers do tend on average to make more than folks with just a high school degree uh their wages haven't been rising the way that that folks may may think and again part partially that's a function of our failure to update these labor standards all right thank you 
It is sometimes argued, David, that, that we should continue in Vermont here on our um, CPI path. Um, and I believe you've answered that, but not question, um, but not quite so directly. I wonder if you would now, why that sure. would or would not be a good idea. Well, it certainly is good to, to at least to do that. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, the fact that Vermont has that indexation has prevented an erosion in wages that a lot of your neighbors have experienced over the last decade uh, for low-wage workers. The question is, is the current level adequate for workers in Vermont today in terms of both, both what it costs to live and uh, you know what, where they are relative to typical workers in the economy. Um, you know, if you if you only keep the minimum wage, at, if you only adjust it for inflation every year, what you're basically saying is that no matter what happens in the overall economy, someone who's a minimum wage worker is never going to have their material standard of living change. It's never going to improve. Uh, you know, the next generation's minimum wage worker is going to have the exact same quality of life as the previous generation's minimum wage worker. Now, that's better than letting that quality of life erode, as has happened throughout most of the rest of the country. But I think an argument could be made that, you know, with improvements in technology, with growth in the economy, with, you know, the U.S. becoming a much richer country, some of the benefits of that should also go to the lowest paid worker, so that someone starting off in, in a job or someone who's stuck in the lowest paid job or close to the lowest paid job is seeing their quality of life materially improve uh, as a result of improvements in the economy overall. And that would mean you have to do more than just keep the minimum wage locked in to CPI. Thank you. Representative Stevens. The state of Vermont since 1999 has developed a basic needs budget, which then ends up with what we consider a livable wage, and it and it, it it sort of matches the calculator that you put forward. But, but at, when I look at again, when I look at the number of college graduates that that are working at a sub fifteen an hour wage, one of the one of the things that this basic needs budget doesn't include is either consumer debt or college debt, which are now which have exploded in the last fifteen or twenty years. Um, do does your calculator or the calculators you use even include that? Because I would think that if I'm making less than 15 bucks a year, 15 bucks an hour on top of high rent and, and, and high expenses, I have a three to $600 a month college loan if I'm a college graduate, if I'm actually working at this level. Right, so, so our calculator and most of, and I don't know of a single one of these uh, budget calculators that it includes tuition payments or, or college debt. So that would be on top of the expenses that we're describing. Right, that just makes this conversation seem much more magical, right? Because it doesn't take into account those, those numbers. I mean, I, I appreciate your numbers and how solid they are, but I think that's, uh, we've seen it in our basic needs budget that there's a, that, yeah. that hole exists. Well, again, I think that speaks to the, the problem that we, you know, you, you folks right now and, and, and lawmakers in a lot of parts of the country are trying to deal with a problem that has been building for 40 years, the fact that we have not been adequate, adequately raising minimum wages and updating labor standards for most of the last generation. Uh, and, and now we're at this point where costs of living are significantly further away from uh, the value of the minimum wage, and you're, and you're trying to make up a lot of lost ground, and I think that's the problem that you're, you're referring to. Great, thank you. Other questions? David, thank you. This has been really helpful. Great, happy to be here. Digitally. <laughs> Feels like you're here. It worked great. Yeah, you're sitting, yeah. you're sitting in the witness chair. Yeah, so. you are. <laughs> my, uh, my contact information is on the last slide, and, and Ron has my contact information. If, if folks have additional questions, I'm happy to, to field emails or, or phone calls after the fact. Okay, appreciate that. Have a great day. You as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.